Good evening, everybody. Blessing of the Lord be upon you. Happy Feast Day of Ascension. Today, our Father Seraphim, continuing our Bible study for the blessing of His Grace, our Bishop Longin. We are in the first book of Samuel, and the last time we ended by concluding chapter 11. Saul had become the king, and in chapter 11, he started his uh, royal kingly duties, made a certain political alliance, and won a battle. And now we are going to continue with chapter 12 and see how his, let's say, career continues. We are going to take it easy and read the entire chapter 12 because there are some really important concepts coming up in the next few chapters. So, first book of Samuel, chapter 12. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here am I, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, and ye have not found aught in my hand, and they answered, He is witness. Samuel wants to bring the point across one more time, how the people really didn't have the reason or the need to ask for the king that they asked for. They were just fine and would have been just fine being led by the Lord himself through his prophets. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. When Jacob was come into Egypt, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when they forget the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord, and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord. And they served Baalim and Ashtaroth, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And the Lord sent Jerubal and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelt safe. The Lord delivered them through prophets. And when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. The Lord was their king, willing to be their king into all the foreseeable future, and they said, Nay, we want a king. Now therefore, behold the king whom you have chosen, and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord, and serve him, and obey his voice, and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, 
Then shall both ye, and also the king that reigneth over you, continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. The concept we should make a note of here is how merciful the Lord is, and how his providence works. These people, in the Lord's own words, spoken through prophet Samuel, they rejected him. They rejected the Lord, and yet he gave them the chance to still be blessed, along with their king, whom they wanted instead of the Lord. And the Lord said, if you simply follow my commandments, I will still be with you. The Lord is merciful. Verse 16, chapter 12. Now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall set thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil, to ask us a king. Once again, why, to, why destroy the crops? It is the wheat harvest. Unto repentance. They did say, pray to God. Interestingly enough, they said, pray to your God. That he forgive our sin. That we die not. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it had pleased the Lord to make you his people. Let us remember how many times Moses pleaded with the Lord and said, Lord, do not destroy them for your name's sake. Because if Egyptians and the others hear that you did all these wonders for them, only to destroy them in the end, it's about your name. It is a kind of a blasphemy. And the Lord here says, Ye have not been destroyed, and ye shall not be destroyed for his name's sake. Only fear the Lord, and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he had done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed both ye and your king. We are going to see how this is going to give, give us so much space and so many uh, concepts, so much terminology, so many issues to think about when we look at the historic development of societies, the kings and queens and the emperors and empresses and how they ruled and who transgressed against the Lord? Did the people or did the rulers? And how those states fared throughout history. Here, the Lord tells them, you people, you obey the Lord and he will save you and your king. If you turn against the Lord, then the Lord will destroy you and your king. Let's think about, for example, how many times a society is oppressed by the rulers themselves 
and how many times the rulers perish and the whole society, the whole nation is oppressed by outsiders. We'll see plenty of it here when, it time, when the time comes for the Assyrians and Babylonians and all of that. And we can just think very quickly throughout our own history of the things that took place and how and why. We get to chapter 13. In chapter 13, Israelites are preparing for battle against the Philistines, of course. They are assembling um, in Gilead and by Gilgal, familiar name and place. And it says how Saul was getting together the army to go fight the battle. And Samuel, the prophet, had told Saul, the king, to wait there in Gilgal for him. Now here's what happened. Chapter 13, verse 8. 8 through 14, we're going to read. And he, Saul, tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering and the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him, a man after his own heart, and the Lord had commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. We'll see soon enough who that man is, that is after the Lord's heart. Now here, this little section, verses 8 through 14, are labeled Saul's transgression. At first, if one just reads through it, one might not think that a great transgression took place. However, let us try to imagine that normally we have bishop or a priest serving liturgy in the church, and now a king, a ruler, or a general of the army gets nervous and says, well, they're not here yet, I better go serve liturgy by myself. It's not going to happen, it cannot happen, it's not liturgy, it's not valid. The gifts will not be consecrated, the entire mystery that takes place will not take place. This is not something that is in priests' hands exclusively, or the bishops. He is not the owner of God's grace, but he is an ordained, appointed, ordained, anointed servant of God, whose job is to properly administer the sacraments. In the Old Testament, they had the same thing. They had the high priest and the priests and then Levites. 
kind of like bishop, priests, and deacons. And here, the king took it upon himself to do that which the high priest should have done. In this case, that would have been the prophet Samuel. I'm going to read a few lines from the patristic commentary on the Holy Scripture. We have these nice books here in the library. Very, very detailed. Many, many volumes of explanations and commentaries. So here's the commentary of St. John Chrysostom, a great saint of our church, the, the one who not wrote but formulated divine liturgy as we serve it Sunday by Sunday. And he says of Saul's transgression the following. And mark it, take note, the devil desired to bring Saul into the superstition of witchcraft. But if he had counseled this at the beginning, the other would not have given heed. For how should he who was even driving them out? Therefore, gently, and little by little, he leads him on to it. For when he had disobeyed Samuel and had caused the burnt offering to be offered, when he, Samuel, was not present, being blamed for it, he says, the compulsion from the enemy was too great. And when he ought to have bewailed, he felt as though he had done nothing. Bewailed meaning repented, right? Now, consider this huge statement. The devil wanted to bring Saul into the superstition of witchcraft. Let us consider how some people, hopefully outside the church, not inside, might look at sacraments and what we do in the church. <clears throat> Liturgy is served. The gifts are consecrated. They do become body and blood of Christ. It's called mystery or sacrament because the logical, rational mind cannot explain what is happening during a sacrament or a mystery. Blessing of the water is not officially a sacrament, and yet, before it's blessed, it's regular water. After it's blessed, it's something different. Some people put it under a microscope. They found it was very different. We are not going to tempt the Lord our God, but if we can just take that water, put it in a bottle, and have it sit on a shelf somewhere, for 10 or 100 years, and it doesn't spoil or get moldy, something's different about that water. Now, people do get tempted to think, they probably don't think of our sacraments as witchcraft, but some kind of magic, some kind of magical approach. People might get tempted to enter the realm of superstition, and say, well, if I specifically do things this way and not that way, if I set my candle in the stand or in the sand, wherever it goes, like this and not like that, maybe it's going to be valid a little more than that. We have the, the rules of proper conduct in the church, and it's simply proper conduct for the sake of reverence, recognizing where we are, Proper conduct doesn't mean that if a candle is turned this way and not that way, it's valid or not valid while it burns in the sand. Here, Saul, as St. John Chrysostom said, the devil tried to pull him into the superstition of witchcraft. So Saul figured the priest is not here to kill the animal and burn it. Anybody could kill the animal and burn it, might as well be me. As long as that animal is killed and burnt, we're going to win the war. He is slipping, as St. John Chrysostom says, little by little, down a slippery slope, into the claws of the devil, who is trying to pull him into superstition or witchcraft. 
we could go over countless examples, Old Testament, New Testament, and our own day and age, of how and where people get tempted to, to slip into superstitions. I'm not going to say superstitions of witchcraft, but superstitions, prasnovierie, empty belief, people do get tempted regularly to do that. So, in the rest of chapter 13, after the transgression takes place, Israelites are still getting ready for battle, verses 15 through 23, and then in chapter 14, the battle actually takes place. And what we are going to bring up here in chapter 14 is just one concept. The battle starts, and Saul's son, Jonathan, leads a very small company toward the enemy ranks, and they are victorious. And Saul makes an order that nobody is to eat anything until the battle is finished. And Jonathan, his son, is telling people First, he himself took some wild honey from where they were in the forest. And somebody said, but Saul, your father made an order that nobody is to eat anything until the battle is over, until the sun goes down. And he says, forget my father, he is destroying this land. Go ahead and eat and you will feel better like I feel better. He actually uses the phrase, when I ate this honey, my eyes were opened, and now I see things clearly. We can just leave it here with the concept of disobedience begets disobedience. This is something that plagues so many people, individuals, families, tribes, nations, civilizations. Saul disobeyed Samuel's order, which was, of course, you cannot offer a whole burnt offering, sacrifice to the Lord. I will. I'm the high priest. I'm the prophet here. And then Saul's son, Jonathan, says also, forget Saul. Forget dad. You don't have to listen to him. Do what I say, and you will feel better like I do. And we shall go on and be victorious without any obedience and without any blessing. We'll leave it here and next time we'll continue. We'll conclude chapter 14 and continue in 15 and see just how things develop for Saul and Jonathan and that new man who is after the Lord's own heart. God's blessing be upon you. Good night.